I loved The Chalice and the Blade when it came out. Today, my guest is the author of that book, Dr. Rian Eisler. She's going to talk with us about her most recent book, so stay tuned. Dr. Rian Eisler is a social system scientist, cultural historian, and attorney whose research, writing, and speaking has transformed the lives of people worldwide. I first became acquainted with her work in her best-selling book, The Chalice and the Blade. Her newest work, Nurturing Our Humanity, How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives, and Future, is fabulous. It's co-authored with anthropologist Douglas Bry and shows how to construct a more equitable, sustainable, and less violent world based on partnership rather than domination. I am so delighted to have you here, Dr. Ian. I am so glad you're here. And as you know, as I was sharing with you, I have been absolutely loving your new book that we're going to talk about today, Nurturing Our Humanity. And as you were so influential for many of us with The Chalice and the Blade, this book expounds even further on domination and partnership models and what they're doing to us. So thank you for being here with us. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Now, you share a story in your book that touched my heart, so I'm hoping you'll share it with us today. And that is um, your experience as a child, leaving Europe and the conditions that forced your family to leave Europe. And it, it sounded as though it initiated your inquiry into domination and partnership. Would you share that story? Yes, and it certainly ignited my passion for this work, even long, long before I started my multidisciplinary research and writing. Um, I was, as I write, (coughs) excuse me, in Nurturing Our Humanity, a child refugee with my parents from the Nazis. So that really from one day to the next, uh, we became hunted with license to kill. And I still remember I was a very small child, a crystal night when a gang of Gestapo men came to our house and dragged my father off. So I these were traumatic experiences. At the same time, that night, I and I, I always want to say that people often ask me, well, after all this trauma, why are you really looking at reconstruction, at how we can build the conditions that will support our capacities for caring and for consciousness and for creativity, rather than, because we have those, obviously, our capacities for insensitivity, cruelty, destructiveness. And I think that the example of my mother uh, displaying what I today call spiritual courage, not the courage that we've been taught, you know, to slay the dragon or the enemy, but the courage to stand up against injustice out of love. And she recognized one of the young Nazis as an Austrian Uh, who had been an errand boy for the family business. And she got furious. I mean, how dare you do this to this man who has been so kind to you? And, of course, uh, she could have been killed because many Jewish people were killed that night. But by a miracle, she wasn't. By another miracle, she obtained his release, my father. By another miracle, we escaped uh, to Cuba to Havana, one of the of only two places, Shanghai and Havana, that sold sold entry permits to desperate Jewish families. Um, and I grew up in the industrial slums of Havana, um, where I really experienced and observed another terrible injustice, you know, the enormous gaps between haves and have-nots at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, Batista was, you know, uh, but it wasn't just Batista, it was a tradition of, you know, those on top just exploited those on bottom. Um, And so this all led me to questions. And these are the questions that my research, years later, of course, uh, sought 
to really systematically explore. Uh, the question was, does it have to be this way? Uh, when we humans have such a capacity, well, I saw for love, for caring. Uh, why has there been so much violence and so much cruelty? Is it, as we're often told, inevitable, you know, human nature? Or are there alternatives? And if so, what are these? And uh, that's the question that my research looks at in a very systematic, multidisciplinary, and holistic way. Because most studies of human, the past, the present, the possibilities for our future, uh, really, if you think about it, either marginalize or completely ignore the majority of humanity, women and children. And this does not. And once you look at the whole picture, of course, uh, well, you can connect the dots because you are including, for one thing, huge dots, huge, 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 that have been left out in order to maintain what I call domination rather than partnership systems. One of the things I loved about The Chalice and the Blade and this book, Nurturing Our Humanity, is from my perspective, you widen the lens of human yes. evolution. You say, okay, that's an interesting perspective if you're looking at evolution from a domination perspective. It's going to look a certain way. But you widen the lens for us and define it and analyze these two different models of domination or partnership. So for our viewers, would you expound on that a little bit more? What in your mind is a domination model compared to a partnership model? And uh, by the way, I don't know if you have uh, viewers in Spain or in Latin America, but um, uh, Chalice was just uh, in a new translation in Spain, Calice y Espada, and it really ignited a virtual media storm. I've been interviewed by the, I mean, about a dozen major, major outlets like El País, uh, etc. But to answer your, your question, um, you know, we're so used uh, in what I really think of as the domination trance, okay? Uh, to a very fragmented way of looking at human societies, because we're all part of certain social systems, right? Uh, I mean, the consciousness today, uh, for example, in healing, um, in the healing uh, professions, that you have to look at the larger context and even the focus on trauma. I mean, these are all partnership trends, aren't they? Because Freud, for example, he just was talking about just. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about not only healing, but thriving, but growing. And that's a very much more of a leaving the domination trance. Now, if you look at societies through the conventional categories and linguistic psychologists have long told us that the categories provided by a language, a culture's language, channel our thinking. So it's almost impossible to see other alternatives. Uh, they're very strange because most of them, right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, capitalist, socialist, if you really look at them, they uh, are very much based on the domination assumptions that anything connected with the majority of humanity, women and children, just isn't that important. And we are educated that way. I remember one day I thought, my gosh, in all of my so-called higher education, why is it really that there has been almost nothing by, for, or about people like me, women? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's beginning to change a little, another partnership trend. But when I was going to school, that was 
I mean, the humanities, for example, think about it, we call them the humanities, but they have almost nothing about the majority of humanity. Anyway, <laughs> if you leave these lenses behind and look at the whole of humanity, the whole of our history, including our prehistory, you begin to see patterns that keep repeating themselves, for which we have had no names. So I called one the partnership configuration and the other one, the domination configuration. It's really a scale, what I call the partnership domination social scale, uh, because no society is a pure domination or partnership system. And once you have these lenses, as uh, so many people who have read my work, who have heard me speak, giving keynotes, etc., cetera, uh, it, it, it really, I mean, things that seem random and disconnected fall into place. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Chalice was the first book reporting my findings, introducing these two, the domination or dominator model and the partnership model, uh, also introducing uh, some very interesting alternatives to either matriarchy or patriarchy. I mean, think about it. Those are the gender-specific categories provided by our language. So what, what does it tell us? Either father's rule or mother's rule. There is no partnership alternative. So I coined the term uh, instead of androcracy, which is ruled by men, because it isn't just fathers. Uh, I introduced the term gylany. Uh, gyne for women, andros for men, etc. But anyway, it's a it's a holistic way, as you said, widening the lens, looking at the fact that what we consider just women's and children's issues, just, is fundamental, foundational. It's one of four cornerstones that we must change. You know, the last chapter, as you know, in Nurturing Our Humanity, uh, details these four cornerstones. Childhood. Why? Because we know from neuroscience that we are not born with completely formed brains, of course, and that our brains, the very structure of our brains, the synapses, the connections, and hence how we think, feel, and act, including how we vote, uh, are very directly related to the interaction of our genes with our environment, which for humans is cultural and very different, depending to the degree that a society, whether it's Eastern, Western, capitalist, socialist, et cetera, et cetera, leftist, rightist, uh, orients to the partnership or domination side. And of course, gender, uh, we have had, and I'll mention this and then stop, a what I've called a hidden system of gendered values. Uh, in which, which we really have to unpack and make visible, because just saying that we should be kinder, that, that doesn't do it. Uh, we have to understand that why is there always in domination-oriented uh, regimes, and we've inherited a lot of this gender system of values, it's always money for prisons, right? Well, who's that? That's the punitive male head of household, in domination systems for weapons or wars, you know, the hero as warrior, as killer. But somehow there isn't enough money for caring for people, starting at birth, child care, health care, uh, paid parental leave. Thank goodness the, well, I wrote a book in between. I mean, I wrote several books in between Charles and nurturing our humanity. And one of them is called The Real Wealth of Nations. And the subtitle is Creating a Caring Economics. And of course, the president of the United States is now using the term caring economy. It's become co-opted somewhat to just mean the direct care, the care economy, rather than a whole economic system informed mm -hmm. by caring. Uh, but, uh, and I also, by the way, coined the term human infrastructure 
and natural infrastructures, yes. which yes. Uh, the <laughs> president is beginning to use. So I've been very prescient in my in my books. Um, and uh, what's nice is that in a way I've sort of been ahead of my time, but the times are catching up. Thank goodness. Thank, Thank goodness we are. And, and you've given form and language. Thank you so much for that, because it gives us a, a platform with which to communicate what yeah, we no, as long As long as we're stuck in the old categories, it they fragment our consciousness. It's, it, they keep us in this domination trance. That's right. And we know the limits of that. We experience it. And you speak to that in your book as well. There are limits to the domination model. Would you speak to what you've observed in terms of those limits? Well, uh, the, let me count the ways here. <laughs> I mean, uh, what we're really talking about is a top-down system, whether it's man over man, man over woman, uh, race over race, religion over religion, uh, or man over nature, you know, the conquest mm -hmm. and domination of nature. That's all part of the so the environmental movement, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, they're all part of the movement towards partnership. They're not isolated. And this is, I think, one of the most important uh, aspects of this work, because as long as people keep fighting, like I'll talk about economics for a moment. If, if, if people keep fighting about capitalism or socialism, they're stuck because both these th economic theories, and we live by theories, uh, they came out of the 1700s, the 1800s, very early industrial times. We're now in the 21st century post-industrial era, but that's only part of the problem. I mean, they'd be antiquated. They are antiquated uh, as operating systems. But because they came out of times that oriented more to the domination side, for both Smith and Marx, I mean, this is this is fundamental. There's nothing about caring for our natural life support systems, just as there is, they, they relegated the work of caring for people, for children, for keeping a clean and healthy home environment, which of course translates into our planetary home, as just reproductive rather than productive, as women's work to be performed. I mean, this is very specific, and we should be taught this, to be performed for free by a woman in a male-controlled household. So as late as when Marx was writing, in most places, I mean, as an attorney, aside from a system scientist, um, I already start with a multidisciplinary approach. I know that there were laws in many, many places still that a woman could not, a wife could not sue herself for injuries inflicted on her neg negligently. Only her husband could for loss of her services. That's our heritage. So take it to GDP, for example, GDP uh, follows that model, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So it not only includes as productive work activities that actually harm and take life, you know, like making, selling cigarettes, the medical bills, the funeral bills, they're all part of GDP. It absolutely ignores or very gives very low value to the work of caring for people starting in childhood or caring for a natural uh, life support systems. Uh, and we know, I mean, and I really want to stop and give you a chance to ask questions, but uh, we know today that this work is enormously economically valuable. And we at the Center for Partnership Systems have developed new metrics because we value what we measure and we measure what we value, right? Called 
we're working really, we introduced uh, social wealth economic indicators in 2014, but there were 24 of them. And we're now condensing a team of economists uh, is condensing and updating an index, a social wealth index as a tool for policymakers, for impact investors, for social activists, for all of us. So I invite our viewers to go to centerforpartnership.org and look for this and really support this, get your organizations to support it because we need new metrics. We absolutely do. And you're speaking to that third cornerstone, right? Yes. After childhood and gender, we need to look at our economics. And you're absolutely right. Women's gifts, abilities, skills, and interests, areas of interest in the areas that have been tradi traditionally left to us yes. for centuries have been so deeply undervalued. And we're just coming in, um, in first world countries. And I think I'm seeing some of this in the third world countries where I have connections that we're beginning to understand how absolutely vital that more holistic approach is to our over our all well-being as individuals, as all individuals and within our countries and our ability to interact. Absolutely. We've really been counting the wrong things. And that is fatal, mm -hmm. potentially, uh, both for people and for our natural habitat. And the two, of course, are interconnected. Yes. Yes, I remember talking to uh, or listening to actually a lecturer some years ago who was in specialized in finance, and he was speaking to his experience. Just to exemplify this point, he was speaking to his experience with a social worker who was there with him and his family at the time of his mother's death, and how invaluable her support was to their mental and spiritual well being. And then went on to illustrate that she should be paid less than someone who was in finances. Oh, and at that's which crazy. Point I left. I said, you're not my teacher. Because Absolutely <laughs> not. Well, we need to look at the rewards. And this is where the new metrics, the social wealth index, is so vital. And I have to say, to sort of remind, uh, see, we can all change the conversation about everything, including economics. Economics are human creations, as I said. We can change them. And I, I introduce a new economic approach called a caring economics of partnerism. Mm -hmm. And I really think that we need to start talking about this and stop arguing about, I mean, if COVID-19 showed anything, it's that we need both uh, businesses and government policies. But the question is what kinds of policies, what kinds of values, what kind of work do we reward? I mean, these are the basic questions. And we're finally beginning to have conversations about them, beginning. Thankfully, we are. And I think for those of us that are listening today, I really want to bring home this concept that it comes from this ability to have this conversation that, that Rian is talking about comes from within ourselves and our own sense of value that has been diminished generationally for a long, long, long time. And we're this wonderful generation born from the labors of our mothers before us and our mothers before them, we have this opportunity to actually change the conversation born from a new set of beliefs within ourselves of our own worthiness. It begins with changes in consciousness. I mean, I uh, write, as you know, in Nurturing Our Humanity about how I suddenly woke up in the early 70s, late 60s, as if from a long drugged sleep, uh, to realize, as thousands of other women were realizing, that uh, our problems weren't personal, they were social, they were cultural. And really, nurturing our humanity uh, 
has all the neuroscience. I mean, because people talk like to talk about hard science. Well, here's the hard science. And it completely validates the proposition, for example, that why, if you think about it, why would both Hitler's Nazi Germany, Stalin's former Soviet Union, Khomeini's Iran, the Taliban, ISIS, all want to either impose or maintain a rigidly male-dominated, authoritarian, highly punitive family. The neuroscience, and this is part of my cultural transformation theory, of course, uh, there's a reason for it. Uh, this is what how our brains are formed. And uh, there are so many studies, for example, studies showing that people who grow up in rigid domination environments as mediated, well, largely by families, of course, but also by religion and by education and by the whole culture or subculture, that the parts of their brains that help us be resilient, that help us really see change and act appropriately are less effective in these people. Now, this leads, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very convoluted thing, uh, but why do we see people so, I mean, in the United States, 60, 70 some million people voted for Donald Trump. And they, these are the people who are in denial, aren't they? Whether it's climate change denial, election result denial, uh, COVID-19 denial, they, 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 they can change. I mean, what the studies show is eventually people with this kind of mindset, but they tend to follow the authority figure, the strong man. You remember the punitive male head of household? That's right. Uh, and even if, if a woman, I mean, there were, there's so many studies really in nurturing our humanity. If a woman takes that role and, and there's a husband around, she's henpecking, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. She can be the dominator. And very often it is women, really. This is not a matter of women against men or men against women. It is both women and men really reclaiming our full human possibilities. Yes, yes. And, and that we getting can... rid of these rigid gender stereotypes and, and of course getting rid of the ranking then of this set of characteristics over that set of characteristics. Um, and it permeates everything, economics, religion. Uh, I, I wrote an article that you can actually get on our website on really uh, regaining, it's, it was for a, a journal called Cosmos, how we can really sort our the teachings in our scriptures between using the partnership domination lens. Because at the core of all world religions are what? I mean, these so-called feminine soft teachings, aren't they? Of caring for others, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't be violent. But then there is this domination overlay that really was added on in the course of domination history. But but it's such a recent history. That's the other thing that we have been told an absolutely false story. I mean, we're told that war is human nature. Archaeology shows that war is at most five to 10,000 years old. Think about that for a moment. It came with the domination system, with authoritarian, male-dominated, uh, highly abusive and violent, really, systems. And we're trying to leave them behind, but it, it, it's also really disconnected still, and we need to connect the dots. Yes, and it's self-perpetuating. Once you've yes. been in a position of domination and you've been taught that that is what is normal and you oh. challenge that so beautifully, that it's not normal. It's just what has been. 
Yeah, but this is, you know, and, and Gandhi said it. He said we should not confuse what is habitual for what is natural. Mm -hmm. And I, and the other thing I'd like to quote another male icon, because those are the icons that we have had until, well, actually we have lots of female deities even from antiquity, but that's, I mean, Chalice and the Blade, Sacred Pleasure. Uh, Sacred Pleasure, I don't know if you've read it. I haven't read it yet. Oh, you must. Because it looks at both sexuality and spirituality using this lens of the partnership domination social scale. And it's an amazing uh, book. I, I wasn't planning to write that book. Uh, it, 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 but the material in doing my research, it was just there. I mean, because think about it, candles, this is how I started the book, candles, music, and wine, they are part of romance, aren't they? But they're also integral to our most sacred rites. Mm -hmm. Now, why, why is the word passion something that we use for both sexual love and for religious ecstasy? I mean, and I trace this. Um, Anyway, it, 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 it is a fascinating book, which you must, must read. But the main thing is that uh, we need to educate ourselves, change our consciousness. That's really the first step. And we have a lot of materials. I mean, the website centerforpartnership.org is a goldmine of resources. But we also have online courses like Changing Our Story, Changing Our Lives, with four videos, and that we used to do it at a specific time, and now we are repurposing it to be on demand. Excellent. And I am also, for those who want to get a, a degree, a PhD, or a master's, uh, starting in December, I'll be teaching at Meridian University uh, in a new concentration for partnership practitioners. And we have a course, if you go to the Meridian website or to the center website, um, I'm going to turn off my telephone here, which I forgot to do. No <laughs> Forgive me, but that's okay. We're, we're at home. Um, um, the course is a um, very reasonably priced course um, with only seven sessions for both the general public and for graduate students. Uh -huh. So I highly, highly recommend that you go to either the center website or the Meridian website and register and I'll see you there. That's awesome. And we will have the links below everyone so you can get to these quite yes. easily. And I'm excited to check it all out as well. And the last um, cornerstone you recommend, we've been alluding to it throughout, but I want to make sure we honor it. And that is narratives and language partnership language as opposed to domination language? Oh, we are so unconscious. I mean, like kill two birds with one stone. Well, I, I managed to change it to hatch two birds with one egg. I love it. <laughs> I mean, but there's so many things we can all see. I believe in human creativity. Why? Because just about everything around us from our physical surroundings to our cultural surroundings are human creations. Uh, so, um, but uh, story is, and language, we need the language of the partnership system and the domination system, uh, partnerism. We need this new economic model uh, because otherwise we're just floundering around here. I mean, think of, of, of the, the domination system of authoritarianism, of rigid male dominance, of violence. I mean, you can see it in, in Idi Amin, a, a tribal society. You can see it in a leftist society, like Silence from the Soviet Union, or uh, North Korea for that matter. But you can also see it in religious Eastern societies, Western societies. I mean, these categories really fragment our consciousness. But story, you know, 
I always have to sort of, in a sense, laugh because people, uh, you know, the advocates of original sin and the ad advocates of selfish genes are fighting each other. But it's the same story. I mean, isn't it really? What does it say about, quote, human nature that we're bad and we have to be rigidly controlled from the top? What we know now, and I really... Uh, there's a lot of evidence of this in nurturing our humanity, as you know, um, that if anything, we are wired by evolution for a partnership rather than domination system. Uh, studies, for example, show, you know, using the these MRIs, you know, that we now have, for looking at the brain, that the so-called pleasure centers in our brains light up more when we share and care than when we win or dominate. Yes. So let's create this society, not a utopia, I call it a pragmatopia, a practical place. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's be aware of what we're doing. Yes, beautifully said. Beautifully said. And I think if I heard you correctly, I just really heard you speak to what your legacy is. Would you agree? Very definitely. I mean, my legacy is um, to really recognize. I've been very prescient. You know, I wrote a book uh, years and years ago out of my uh, legal background, uh, the Equal Rights Handbook on the proposed Equal Rights Amendment, which is still in print. I think you can get it somewhere on, on Amazon or on the web. And I predicted that if the Equal Rights Amendment was defeated, we would see a massive political regression in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the two scenarios that end the Chalice and the Blade, which came out first, in 87 is 33. Oh, and when you buy that book, be sure to get the 56th or 57th US printing because it has an epilogue that takes it to the Trump years. Ah. And then people buy a used copy. And I mean, you can probably get a used copy of the 56th printing if you must. Or, I mean, it's, it's not that expensive. I mean... Um, it's, it's been sort of an evergreen, really. But um, the two scenarios that end the book, break down and break through in evolution, are so prophetic. You know, I didn't know. So, and so, and of course, the four cornerstones redirecting us to pay attention to these four cornerstones and move them from domination to partnership. Yes. Childhood parenting. I mean, that's a huge thing that's, thank goodness. I mean, we're, it's, it's not laissez faire parenting. It, we're talking now about authoritative rather than authoritarian and non violent, no spanking mm -hmm. parenting. Mm -hmm. Very, very important because we have traumatized populations. I mean, the book uh, Nurturing Our Humanity has. Uh, so many studies, as you know, of how prevalent trauma is, even in the United States, where we don't have genital mutilation, where we don't have child labor. I mean, just think about it. Yes, yes. And as so many of my viewers know, but we do have that domination language. We have that domination experience of feeling oppressed. We are sexually abused. We are physically abused. And we come out of those environments unable to hear or to see it in the world around us, in our religions, in our politics, in our, in our job situations, until at some day it erupts in us. We start to see it. Um, well, we it's almost like the boxes in your head, you know, switching. Yes. And I, I mean, I get so many uh, emails and when I before COVID, you know, when I used to do in-person keynotes, people coming up to me saying there were so many aha experiences mm -hmm. reading your 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 work. And for me doing the research, I mean, like I, I, be, I, I, when I was a kid, I always wanted to know, you know, in the Bible, it says 
that woman will henceforth be subordinate to man. Yeah, henceforth. And I always wanted to know well, what was it like before the henceforth? <laughs> I love the way mind work. Talk about it. And, and then I also wanted to know why would, would Eve, a woman, ask advice from a serpent, from a snake? I mean, we don't usually do that. Well, in terms of the old reality, you know, remember the Minoan goddess figurines with the snakes coiled? They mm-hmm. are in an oracular trance. Mm-hmm. So in terms of the old reality, that made a lot of sense. But then there's a new reality, you know, you may only think, think, never mind do, as I tell you to think. Mm -hmm. And there you have it, the partnership, the chalice or the blade. Well, thank you for giving us your life's work in such beautiful ways. I love your mind. I'm not a researcher in the way that you are. So I get very excited when I read a book like this with the depth of investigation that you've done that substantiates what I think many of us feel inside, but haven't known how to do the research or haven't been compelled to, or had the words and the concepts to speak clearly about what we feel i think we can all get more and more people to read this book we can write columnists we can write opinion makers thought leaders i mean it's up to us Mm -hmm. to change the conversation and nurturing our humanity because it has so much neuroscience you know this hard science in it Mm -hmm. um it's probably um, as good as anything Uh, that I can think of. I mean, there's always chalice, but that doesn't have the neuroscience. And of course, also it doesn't, it has some of the economics already. It's interesting. Um, Anyway, I um, have a great deal of, as I said, faith in human creativity. Mm. And we need to use it now. Now's the moment. Because the domination system is simply going to take us to an evolutionary dead end. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for giving us the tools to be able to have new thoughts, new conversations, and new ways of living together. I just deeply honor you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Misa. It's been a pleasure talking with you. All the best. Be sure to pick up my free holding meditation for divine feminine healing and awakening, and that link is below. And of course, if you love what you've heard today, subscribe to my YouTube channel for even more. Mm